Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Very excited today that we're being joined by Dr. Dean Ornish. He's the founder and president of the nonprofit Preventative Medicine Research Institute, and clinical professor of medicine at UCSF and clinical professor of medicine at UCSD. He received his MD from the Baylor College of Medicine, was a clinical fellow in medicine at Harvard Medical School and completed an internship and residency in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He earned a BA in humanities, summa cum laude from the University of Texas in Austin where he gave the baccalaureate address. For over 43 years, he has directed clinical research demonstrating for the first time that comprehensive lifestyle changes may begin to reverse even severe coronary heart disease without drugs or surgery. Dr. Ornis was recognized as one of the 125 most extraordinary University of Texas alumni in the past 125 years by Time Magazine as Time 100 Innovator, by Life Magazine as one of the 50 most influential members of his generation, and by People Magazine as one of the most interesting people of the year. He was also recognized by Forbes Magazine as one of the world's seven most powerful teachers. Today, Dr. Dean Ornish is with Banyan Books in conversation about his book titled, Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases. The book was published in 2019 and the paperback edition was just released. Undo It is written by Dr. Ornish and his wife, Ann Ornish, who has been his collaborator for over 20 years. And the book is a distillation of Ornish's more than four decades work in lifestyle medicine and full with useful evidence-based information and practical how-to guides. It's a comprehensive guide and program, not just for preventing and reversing chronic illness, but for living a life that is full with meaning, love, and connection. I really love this book, and it's one I know I'll keep on my shelf and, and use as a reference over the years. So for anyone who would like to learn more about Dean and Ann Ornish's work, you can visit the website www.ornish.com. Dot com. Banyan Books community, please join me in a warm welcome for Dean Ornish. Dr. Ornish, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I think you're muted there. Yeah, thank you. I think <laughs> apparently, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the most commonly used phrase last year was you're on mute. So <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, so inspiring that you've been an independent bookstore for better part of 50 years or over 50 years, it sounds like. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. And I know a lot of the Banyan community is very familiar with your work and a lot of people be excited that you're here with us. I'm excited Uh, too. So I'd like to open with a, with a quote that is, is partway into the book and sort of gives an overview of where we find ourselves in modern life with our health. Uh, You write, Your mind and body have not yet had time to evolve to deal with the excesses and disruptions of 21st century life. 
a diet high in animal protein, fat, and sugar, a sedentary lifestyle, often chronic and unrelenting emotional stress, and the widespread breakdown of social networks that cause people, that used to give people a strong sense of connection, community, and love, often leading to chronic emotional depression. The result of this disruption is that many people are not healthy and not happy and are often emotionally depressed and chronically ill. Now your life's work and, and the solution to this is what you call lifestyle medicine. I'm just wondering for those who might not be familiar with that term, if you can help us understand what lifestyle medicine is. Sure. Yeah, the Undead book that I co-authored with my wife, and Anne, who I've worked with now for over 24, 25 years, lost track, um, begins with one of my favorite quotes, which is from Albert Einstein that says, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And so I tried to reduce all the things you're talking about to its essence. You know, lifestyle medicine is a field that I help create. Some people call me the father of lifestyle medicine, which is simply using lifestyle changes, not only to help prevent disease, but often to treat and sometimes even reverse it. Uh, these include a whole foods, plant-based diet, essentially a vegan diet that's low in fat and sugar, moderate exercise, like walking a half an hour a day or with some strength training, uh, stress management techniques, stretching, breathing, meditation, yoga-based stress management, and love and support, uh, like support groups, time we spend with our friends and family, or to reduce it to its essence, to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. That's it. And the more diseases we study, the more evidence we have to show what a powerful difference these simple changes can make. And the quote, the excerpt that you read from the book a moment ago, is that it's not that we're built wrong, it's just that our bodies haven't had time and minds haven't had time to evolve so that the same mechanisms that really have evolved to protect us because they're so chronically stimulated in the case of emotional stress can harm or kill us. Uh, you know, you're, for example, we really evolved to deal with acute stress, you know, walking along in the mythical jungle and the saber toothed tiger jumps out at you and, you know, either you run away from the tiger or you fight the tiger and kill it or the tiger eats you, but one way or another, it's over pretty quickly. And so you want during those times of stress, your arteries to constrict and your blood to clot faster and your heart to beat faster and so on, um, and your, your blood pressure to go up so that if the tiger bites you while you're fighting it, you're, you don't bleed as much. You know, the arteries constrict faster, your blood clots faster and so on. But in modern times, metaphorically, there are tigers around every corner. And so these mechanisms get chronically activated. And so these same mechanisms that are really supposed to protect us can often kill us so that the arteries, not just in your arms and legs, constrict or the blood clots there, but in your heart, for example, or in your brain leading to a stroke. So what I tried to do in this book is to say, you know, over the last four decades, I've directed a series of <clears throat> randomized trials showing that these simple lifestyle changes can reverse the progression of a wide variety of chronic diseases. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as a new drug, a new laser, something really high tech and expensive. Uh, and we often have a hard time believing that these simple lifestyle changes. Some people say, oh, dying lifestyle, that's kind of boring, you know, has to be a new drug, a new laser, or something really high tech to be powerful. And I think our unique contribution <clears throat> has been to use these very high tech, expensive, state of the art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low tech and low cost interventions can be, like the ones I've mentioned. <clears throat> and we showed for the first time, for example, that even severe heart disease could be reversed by making these changes. When I started doing these studies in 1977, people thought that once you had heart disease, it could only get worse. And at best, you could slow down the rate at which you got worse, and that was it. <clears throat> we showed, you know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure, that if you can actually make bigger changes in a lot of things at the same time, you, your body has a remarkable capacity to begin healing in many cases, and much more quickly than we had once realized, that these arteries, rather than get more and more clogged over time, can get less and less clogged. And then we found that, you know, people who are get put on drugs for the rest of their lives to treat their high blood pressure, or their high cholesterol, or their, um, their, uh, their blood sugar being high. And they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these pills? And the doctor says, it's like forever. And it's like, you know, sometimes when I lecture, I'll show a cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing, but nobody's turning off the faucets. Like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, well, forever. Like, well, why don't we just turn off the faucet? Why don't we treat the cause? And more often than not, the cause are the lifestyle choices we make each day. 
And we found over in a series of studies over many decades that these same lifestyle changes could, um, you know, under a doctor's supervision, many people can reduce or get off of these medications they were told they'd have to take the rest of their lives to lower their cholesterol, their blood sugar, their blood pressure. We found, again, heart disease could be reversed, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, early stage prostate cancer. We found when you change your lifestyle, it changes your genes, turns on the genes that keep us healthy, turns off the genes that cause us to get sick. We did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, ends of our chromosomes that regulate how long we live. Uh, as we get older, our telomeres get shorter, and as our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter, and the risk of, of pretty much all these different diseases goes up proportionate to that. Uh, we found we could actually lengthen telomeres for the first time, and when we published this, the Lancet editors called it uh, first study showing the lifestyle changes can reverse aging at a cellular level. And we're now in the middle of doing the first randomized trial to see if these same lifestyle changes might stop or even perhaps reverse the progression of men and women who have early stage Alzheimer's disease, which would be in many ways, the most important work, because nothing works for Alzheimer's. We'll come back to that. And Medicare created a new benefit category 12 years ago, at least in the U.S., so that people can go through my lifestyle program, which is 72 hours long, twice a week, four hours a week for nine weeks. And more recently, just in October, they're covering it when it's offered virtually. So if people in Canada who are interested in this, just go to Ornish.com and people in the U.S., it'll, it'll also, they'll pay for it as well, which is great. And so I wondered why is it with all this interest in personalized medicine that these same lifestyle changes can affect so many different diseases? You know, I was trained like pretty much all doctors to view these as being fundamentally uh, different diseases, different diagnoses and different treatments. And yet we found these same lifestyle changes could affect all of them. And the reason is, is that they're really not so different from each other. You know, that they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome and telomeres and gene expression and angiogenesis and overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, as we talked about with the tiger, uh, changes in immune function and so on. And each one of these biological mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get and how much love and support we have. And so I think Alzheimer's may be just the latest version of that, we'll find out. You use the term, you, you call this a unifying theory because you say it's the same biological mechanisms underlying all of these chronic illnesses. Can we go a little bit more deeply into that? How, how does that look biologically in terms of this being a unifying theory? Well, just what I talked about, that's why these same lifestyle changes affect all of these different chronic diseases because they all share the same underlying biological mechanism. And these biological mechanisms in turn are directly influenced by the lifestyle choices we make each day. It also helps explain why you'll often have the same person who will have multiple what are called comorbidities. They'll have high blood pressure and be overweight and have high cholesterol and have type 2 diabetes and have heart disease or entire countries. You know, 50 or 60 years ago in most parts of Asia where they tend to eat a plant-based diet, they had strong community ties and so on, um, that their risk of heart disease and these chronic diseases was very low until they started to eat like us and live like us and all too often die like us. And now their rate of all these chronic diseases has gone up as well, not just one of them, but all of them, because they're all interrelated. And so it radically simplifies what we tell people and say, look, if you're just trying to stay healthy, what matters most is your overall way, to, way, way of eating and living. If you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you're bad or you're, <clears throat> you, know, you did something terrible, just eat healthier the next. You don't know, have time to exercise one day, <clears throat> do a little more than next. You don't have time to meditate for an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. It's not all or nothing. If you're trying to reverse a chronic diseases, which is really what undo is all about, um, it takes more. That's why we were the first to show that so many of these diseases could be reversed because it's hard. You have to make big changes. But if you make big changes, in some ways we find it's actually more sustainable than making small changes and only one thing, even though that's you know counterintuitive. It's like people think, well, you know, making one change is hard, making a lot of changes and, and, and big changes is really hard. And yet, you know, only a third of people, for example, who are prescribed cholesterol lowering drugs are taking them just four months later. And they're of proven benefit in people with heart disease and they're usually paid for by somebody else. So why aren't they taking them? And the answer is that they don't make you feel better. You know, that they're, it's like, take this pill to prevent something really bad from happening years down the road that you don't want to think about. So people stop thinking about it. But when you make big changes in lifestyle all at once, you feel so much better so quickly in ways that really matter 
that it, it, it reframes the reason for making lifestyle changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy and pleasure and love and feeling good, which are. And like in the case of someone who's got heart disease, for example, uh, you know, they can't walk across the street without getting chest pain. They can't make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without getting chest pain. And usually within a few weeks, they can do all those things. And then it kind of changes the whole equation. They say things like, you know, I like eating junk food, but not that much because I like being able to, you know, do all these things that are so much more important to me. They bring meaning to my life. And so that's why I love doing this work because we can redefine what's possible by doing these studies. These studies are hard to do, but properly done and with the right, you know, credible investigators and published in the leading, world's leading peer reviewed journals, they can redefine what's possible. And by do so, it can empower people and give them literally at this point, millions of people, new hope and new choices. And that's what brings meaning into my life. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, the, there's the four kind of aspects that you, you simplify it down to. You call it eat well, move more, stress less and love more. I'm yeah. wondering if we can dive a little bit into into eat well. Uh, you know, you've been do, doing this, as you said, for over four decades, and you, I'm sure you've seen a lot of fad diets come and go and, and various studies and different information. And it's one of the areas there's probably the most confusion when I look around in terms of what is the best optimal diet. Can you go a little bit into that for us? Yeah, there's a lot of confusion if you listen to people who haven't done any studies to support what they're saying. There's a lot of diets out there. People just make stuff up, you know, or it sounds good, you know. But one of the reasons why I like, now science can't measure everything. As Dennis Burkett once said, not everything that counts can be counted. And in other words, not everything that's meaningful is measurable, but a lot of things are. And I think what sets my work apart from many others is that, you know, these studies are really hard to do. They're hard to get funded. They're hard to conduct. And, you know, they're hard to get published, but they're worth doing because the whole point of science is to help people sort out what works from doesn't, when what doesn't and for whom and under what circumstances. And so, you know, we've shown that, and I think there's a, among people who do science and who, who really understand this field, there's a real convergence of, of what constitutes a healthy way of eating. You know, it's basically um, eat a, it's as close as you possible to a whole foods plant-based diet that's low in fat, low in sugar, as it comes in nature, predominantly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, things like that, uh, that are naturally healthy for you. And it's, and it's not because they're just low in bad stuff, they're high in lots of good things. There's literally 100,000 substances in fruits and vegetables that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, even anti-aging properties, you know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genesine, lycopene, blah, blah, blah. And where do you find these? And you find them in, in fruits and vegetables. There's also a study that, and, and it's not just the fat versus carbs. You know, I got a lot of those debates years ago with Dr. Atkins and his acolytes, and I've stopped doing them a long time ago, saying, look, if you're interested, this is, you know, this is how you can do it. But... Um, it's not just the fat versus carbs, it's the protein, the animal protein itself is inflammatory. And so we're realizing that uh, when you switch from a, an animal protein, high fat, high cholesterol diet to a whole foods, low fat, low animal protein diet, uh, you get a double benefit. You're not only not getting the things that are disease promoting, but you're getting at least 100,000 others that are, that are disease preventing, that are, that are healing. There's a study, a couple of studies that came out just in November showing the effects of this on COVID. It's not just chronic disease, it's also COVID-19. One study was done uh, in six countries uh, between Harvard uh, School of Public Health and King's College in London. And they looked at uh, almost 3,000 frontline healthcare workers who get exposed to COVID-19 every day because they're taking care of COVID-19 patients. And they found that those eating a, a, a diet like I'm recommending here were 73% uh, less likely to get moderate to severe COVID. Those eating a pescatarian diet, having fish with uh, basically a vegetarian diet with fish were 59% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID. But those eating a high animal protein, high fat diet were 400% more likely to get moderate to severe COVID because of its effect on the immune function. Another even larger study of almost 600,000 people at the Harvard School of Public Health found something similar, a 43% lower risk of getting moderate to severe COVID in those who eat a, a plant-based diet. So again, the more you look, the more evidence you find and the more convergence of evidence that these things are really worth doing. Wow, I, I, first of all, I just wanna say, this is a side comment, but I'm always blown away when I speak to someone with, that I hold in such high esteem as yourself. All of the, the studies and facts that you, can, that you can name off the top of your head, it's incredible <laughs> what, you can, what you can remember. Um, 
you, you mentioned about, you know, like it, you're basically saying not all fats are the same, not all proteins are the same, not all carbohydrates are the same. Now, one of the things I wonder about is sugars. Are, are there differences in the kinds of sugars that we're intaking as well? Well, not really. I mean, sugar or white flour or white rice, uh, when you go from brown rice to white rice or from whole wheat flour to white flour, you're converting a good carb into a bad carb. And the reason I say that is that the fiber is what gets removed when you go from, when you remove the fiber in the bran, which is what causes the rice to be brown uh, and, and take it away and turn it into a white rice, for example. Yeah, the fiber in the bran normally slows the absorption of food from your gut into your blood. And so you get a slow rise in your blood sugar, never gets that high, and then it comes down very slowly. But when you eat white rice, white flour, and particularly when you eat sugar, high fructose corn syrup, any of the concentrated sweeteners, they go right in from your gut to your blood. So your blood sugar spikes, it goes to really high levels, which provoke an insulin response, which brings your blood sugar back down. But it doesn't come down to where it started. It comes down below where it started. It's kind of like if you take a pendulum and you let it go, it doesn't just stop here. It goes all the way to the other side. And the same is true for your blood sugar. It goes too high and you get all this insulin surges. It goes too low and you get that kind of carbohydrate craving. I've got to have more sugar to get my blood sugar back up. But also the um, insulin surges themselves are, cause a lot of inflammation and, and harm. And so the goal is not, you know, we, I agree with the, you know, the keto and paleo and Atkins people that most Americans and most Canadians eat too much sugar. It's what you substitute it with that really we differ. And instead of substituting with, you know, pork rinds and bacon and sausage are not health foods, but fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and so on in their natural form really are. Then you get the protective benefits while minimizing these wide swings in blood sugar. Right. Okay. Thank you. You, you cover, the, just so everybody knows in the book, Dr. Ornish covers a, 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 some common nutrition myths. He lists four of them. And we, we don't have time to get into all of them, but I just want to let everybody know that that's there in the book um, if you want to look more deeply into it. The second, the second aspect in, in, this, in this format is you talk about move more and the, the different kinds of exercise. And you outline three different kinds, aerobic exercise, strength training, and stretching. Why those three? What, what have you found in your research that those three are highlighted? Well, during times of emotional stress, your body can stretch, your muscles contract. It goes back to the saber-toothed tiger story we talked about earlier. It's, it's really designed to protect you so that if you, you know, if you get in a fight or you get into a, a fight with an animal or a person, uh, you don't get hurt as much. You have this body armor, if you will. But again, it's designed so that most of the time we're not under that kind of stress. But if it's chronically activated, then that's when your back starts to give out and, you know, all those things. So anything that's your mind affects your body, but your body also affects your mind. So anything that slowly and gently stretches these chronically tense muscle fibers, not only helps to prevent injury, but also helps your mind to relax as well. It goes both ways. Uh, again, the strength training helps to build muscle mass, which also helps with your uh, insulin and other metabolism. Uh, and so, you know, these things all really make a difference. But since it's the Banyan bookstore, I'd like to take the prerogative of saying, you know, I'd, I'd really like to focus a little more on the love, the love more part of, of the, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. The stress less and love more, a little bit kind of go together. Yes. Um, you know, I got interested in doing this work because I became suicidally depressed when I was in college, when I was 19. And uh, I, I was able to take all the meaning out of life. You know, who cares? So what? Big deal. Nothing but matters. You know, why bother? All that. This kind of existential dread. But also, I felt like I was stupid that somehow I just managed to fool people into thinking that I was smart. And now that I was at a place called Rice University in Houston, uh, where there was a bunch of really smart kids, it was just a matter of time before they figured out what a mistake they'd made in letting me in. And I would have kind of gone through with it, except for the fact that I got so run down and so ragged that I, I literally couldn't get out of bed because I got this horrible case of infectious mononucleosis. My parents came down and saw what a wreck I was, and they took me home to Dallas to recuperate. And my secret plan was to get strong enough to kill myself, as crazy as that sounds. And this was in January of 1973. But my older sister, who had been kind of a child of the 60s, um, found my, that she found a lot of inner peace by studying with an ecumenical spiritual teacher named Swami Satchidananda, who was brought over here in 1966 by the artist Peter Max. And uh, if you saw you know, the Woodstock movie, he, you know, he opened Woodstock. He looks... So my parents decided they would have a cocktail party for the Swami. This was really weird in Dallas, as I'm sure you can imagine, in, in 1973. It was even, it'd be weird today, but it was especially weird then. 
And so there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that was certainly true for me. And so in walks this central casting's idea of what a Swami should look like, you know, long white beard and saffron robe and all that. And he sat down in our living room and began giving a little satsang, a lecture, and started to say, nothing can bring you lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out and felt very validating to hear because everybody would say, oh, no, no, just, you know, get married and make money and get into medical school, then you'll be happy. And I knew that wasn't true. And yet here's this guy saying, you know, nothing can bring you lasting happiness. And he's glowing and I'm ready to do myself in. Like, what am I missing here? And he went on to say what probably sounds like a new age cliche, but to, but to me really turned my life around, which is that nothing can bring us a lasting sense of happiness is the bad news. The good news is that it's our nature for the most part to be happy and healthy and peaceful until we disturb it. And in what may be perhaps the alternate irony, not realizing that, not being mindful of that, we often run after all these different things. You know, gee, if only I had more whatever, then I'd be happy, thinking they're going to bring us a sense of peace and a sense of health, health and well-being. And the paradox is that once you set up that view of the world, as the Swami explained, no matter how it turns out, you feel bad because until you get it, then it's like, wow, I really hope I get it. It's really important. The stresses go way up because the stakes are so high. If you don't get it, you feel stressed. If somebody else gets it and you don't, then you feel really stressed. And it kind of reinforce, reinforces this misperception that we live in a, a zero-sum game world. And the more you get, the less there is for me. And you better get it while you can. And it makes a very hostile, doggy dog competitive environment. Or even when someone gets whatever that is, ah, you know, it's the only, if only I had more money, more power, more sex, more beauty, more accomplishment, the usual things. If you get it, it's like, ah, now I'm happy, you know, now people will love me, now things are good, you know, now I can love myself. But it doesn't last, you know, it's soon followed by invariably, either now what, you know, as a patient later told me, I can't even enjoy the view from the mountain I've climbed, I'm already looking over the next one. Or so what? Big deal. It doesn't really provide that lasting sense of joy and meaning. And so another patient told me years later, um, the letdown that comes from accomplishing a goal is so great. I always make sure I've got a dozen projects going at the same time so I can immediate turn, immediately turn my attention to something new. And so the cycle continues. It's kind of like the, you know, the thing of a, a donkey with a carrot on a stick just you know, right in front of it or trying to chase your shadow. It's just always outside. It just eludes your grasp. And so what the Swami said is that um, that meditation and yoga and other prayer and other secular and spiritual techniques don't bring us a sense of peace. At the end of a meditation, don't tell yourself, oh, the meditation brought me peace, kind of like Valium in another form, but rather to say, oh, this, these practices help me quiet down my mind and body to experience what's always there. And that may sound like a lot of semantics, but the implications are actually quite profound because if it's out there, that means everybody who's got what I think I need to be happy and healthy and love myself has power over me. But if it's me, then it's like, what am I doing to disturb my own innate sense of love and happiness and peace and well-being? Not to blame myself, but to empower myself because I can do something about that. And then the question shifts from how can I get what I think I need to be happy and healthy to how can I stop disturbing what's all there, what's there already? You know, the ancient swamis and for that matter, rabbis and priests and monks and nuns didn't discover these spiritual techniques to bring us a sense of well-being or to unclog our arteries or get our blood pressure down or, you know, perform better in sports or in school or in business. It can certainly help you do all those things. They're actually very powerful tools for transformation, you know, for undoing a lot of the damage that we do to ourselves. That's in part why I call the book Undo It, also because the swami I studied with like to make puns and people say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. You know? So <laughs> it's kind of an homage to him. Also, my favorite key on the keyboard has always been the undo button. But, uh, but it, it's a very powerful thing. And the other thing that happens was when you quiet down your mind, you can experience not only a more inner sense of well-being and peace and, and so on, but you can then paradoxically go out in the world. And that's what happened to me. You know, when I felt like I had to do all these things and do well in school so that I could get into medical school, so that I could love myself and other people would love me. I couldn't even function. You know, I was so stressed out. I couldn't read a headline in a newspaper and tell you five minutes later what it said. But with the more inwardly defined I became, and then he said, you know, and also, by the way, go on a plant-based diet and exercise and, and, and love more. Um, then the paradox was that I, you know, he said all those nice things about me when you introduced me, all those you know, great accomplishments I was able to do um, because the, the less I needed to define myself by those things, the, the less stress there was, the more I could function at a high level. And the Swami, again, liked to say, you know, we're born fine and we define ourselves and get stuck in all these definitions of what we think we need and who we are. 
So for me, doing this work, this research and the service is what I found just as I could take all the meaning out of life, you know, when I'm doing useful things and helping people and empower them and, and having the kinds of dialogue we're having now, that really brings meaning. I can imbue my life with meaning through a life of service. You know, again, is that selfish or unselfish? Well, it's both, you know, it's like, to which organ does your heart pump blood first to? You know, it's people say, oh, my heart first pumps blood to the brain or to my lungs or my sexual organs, depending on who you ask. But it, pump, it pumps blood to itself first so that it can then pump blood to the rest of the body. Is that a selfish act or is that a unselfish act? Well, it's both, you know, and that's, so when I do acts of service, it, it's what brings meaning into my life. So is that selfish? In some ways it is, but that's kind of the good kind of selfish. And so later in medical school, I was trained to deal with pain as, you know, to numb it or kill it or bypass it literally or figuratively. But I realized that the pain is there for a reason. The pain isn't something to be numbed or killed. It's to say, it's just the messenger. It's saying, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something in your best interest. But the other function of pain is that it is a catalyst for transformation. It's kind of like people say, well, it may be hard to make all these lifestyle changes, but boy, I'm hurting so bad. Let me try this weird stuff. And then again, that's part of the value of the research is to get people to say, well, okay, well, it's kind of weird that oh, I was published in all these leading journals. Let me give this weird stuff a try. Medicare is paying for it. it. must have something there. Let me give this weird stuff a try. And because again, these biological mechanisms that control our health and well-being are so dynamic, most people, when they make these changes, especially if they make big changes all at once, they generally feel so much better so quickly, then that makes it sustainable for them. And the other thing that finally that happens, I know I'm kind of going on here, is please, that when your mind I'm taking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> when your mind quiets down, you get access to your own inner Swami, your inner guru, your inner teacher, your inner God, your inner still small voice within, whatever religious or secular metaphor you use. It's that voice that speaks very clearly, but very quietly. It gets drowned out by the, the chatter of everyday life. It's the one that wakes me up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You know, you're not doing something that's in your best interest, or here's the answer that you've been looking for. And I've learned that I can actually, and everyone can, access that inner voice much more intentionally by quieting down my mind enough to hear it, you know, which is, so at the end of a meditation or yoga class or whatever equivalent, I, I'll, I'll, I'll always stop and say, okay, let me hear you a little voice. Like, I, want, I, I want to hear my voice. It'll say hello, and I'll say hello. I know this sounds a little crazy, but it, it works. And then I'll ask the same question, which is, what am I not paying attention to that I need to? And listen for the answer, and it will tell me. And all of the research studies that I've done, every, every study I've done for the last 44 years, people thought was impossible at the time. And that's, first of all, when I decided not to kill myself, that gave me a lot of courage to say, you know, look, if I'm going to choose to live, I need to know what's really true and what's not and what's real and what isn't. And I can't depend on other people to borrow that wisdom from. I need to know for myself. And if I'm going to have any wisdom, I'm going to have to find out from my own experience. And that means I'm going to try just about everything I can that's not going to, you know, permanently damage me or hurt somebody else. Because I need to know. Because if it doesn't work, then there's a lot of wisdom that comes through through failure. You know, you like, oh, that doesn't work. This does work. You know, uh, the people on their deathbeds generally regret what they didn't do, not what they did. Because if you do something and it turns out not to work, there's a lot of wisdom that comes from that. It's not like it was wasted. But if you don't even try because you're afraid, then you know it's just you just have regrets. I didn't want to be one of those people. So I I've done a lot of crazy stuff that probably surprise you. And uh, there's a lot of wisdom that comes from doing that including doing all these studies. But what really gave me the guidance to do those studies was to learn very consciously to, uh, to pay attention to that inner voice, that inner wisdom that we all have and we all share. And finally, one last thing before I forget, is if you take it even deeper, it gives you what the Swami would call a double vision, that on one level we're separate, you know, you're you and I, me. On another level, it gives you that non-dual vision that we're all you know, the same, you know, manifesting in different forms. The Swami liked to use the metaphor of a old style movie projector with the light going through the film. And then uh, on the screen, you get all these different names and forms and dramas, which you can only really enjoy if you also have the double vision of noticing the, the light behind all these different characters. And so it's a, it's a kind of a liberating uh, vision to be able to, to be able to see both the, the unity and the diversity at the same time and really to be able to enjoy it fully by having those experiences. It's so wonderful to hear you speaking on this. Thank you so much. I, I, it's making me wonder, like what, what I'm hearing you speak about it is, is reminding me, you know, in 
as you know, in India, yoga and Ayurveda are sister sciences. They go hand in hand. Um, and I'm, I'm curious um, if you're seeing what value you see in these ancient uh, medical systems like Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, and if you're seeing any kind of uh, openness in the, in the mainstream sort of modern medical field in terms of integrating those modalities uh, into our system. Well, yeah, look at us. I mean, we're using our quote, stress management is really yoga and meditation, uh, which we use. We, we find a, um, a way of meditating that's congruent with a person comfortable with their own values and, and experiences. So if they want to meditate on Om or Shalom or Salam or Amen or Amin or the word one, if they want something secular, they're all words that sound alike that start with an O or an O and end with an M or an N, but it doesn't really matter. What's important is that you know, truth is one, paths are many, that all roads will take you to the same place, but you need to pick one road and, and to stay with it. And so when you say, are these being integrated? Well, as I mentioned earlier, after many years of review, uh, Medicare created a new benefit category to cover my reversing heart disease program after, you know, 15 years of review. And that was a real game changer because, first of all, now Medicare is paying for yoga and meditation as part of, you know, our, it's 72 hours, twice a week, for four hours at a session. So it's an hour of, of supervised exercise, an hour of yoga and meditation, which we call stress management, an hour of a support group to create a sense of, not just help people stay on the diet, but to really create a sense of a sacred community where people can really feel safe enough to let down their emotional defenses and to talk openly and authentically about what's really going on in their lives without fear that someone's gonna you know, judge or criticize or abandon them. And uh, an hour of, uh, uh, a group meal with a lecture. And so, you know, Medicare is paying for that. Most of the medical, most of the other insurance companies in the U.S. are paying for that as well. And, and just in October, uh, Medicare is now covering <clears throat> our program when offered via Zoom. So if anyone, anyone, anywhere is actually watching this, just go to ornish.com and send us your name and information. We'll send you information about our, our program. You know, the reason that I spent so many years of my life doing this is because, as I mentioned before, when, when you're hurting, there's an opportunity for true transformation that I wasn't trained as a doctor to take advantage of. For me, it was depression. For someone else, it might be a heart attack or it might be being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We're in the middle of doing our Alzheimer's study. You know, if, if uh, we're recruiting the last group of people and if you uh, are, you know, you are someone that, you know, has uh, early stage Alzheimer's disease, you know, you're eligible for our study. We do that all for free and we give you uh, 21 meals a week for 40 weeks, you and your spouse that fit these guidelines and so on. You know, study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from pretty much all causes when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. Uh, the real epidemic in all of our cultures, which has only been exacerbated by COVID, is loneliness and depression. Uh, with the breakdown of the social networks, it used to give people a sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years, 60 years ago, most people had a an extended family they saw regularly. They saw had a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people that knew you and watched you grow up. They had a job that felt secure. They'd been at for 10 years or more and got to know their coworkers. They had a church or synagogue or mosque or club or something they went to on a regular basis. And many people don't have any of those things. And we're just now beginning to realize that, that again, when you're lonely and depressed, it increases your risk of dying from pretty much all chronic diseases by many fold, by three to 10 times in, some, in many studies. And so I've learned that it's not enough to just give people information and expect them to make lasting changes in their behavior. I mean, if it were, nobody would smoke. It's not like I'd say, gosh, Ross, you know, I want you to quit smoking. Did you know it's bad for you? And you go, gosh, I didn't know that. I'll quit today. And it's like everybody knows it's on every pack of cigarettes. And so I'd ask people like in these studies, when we got to really know each other well, like, you know, why do you smoke or overeat or drink too much or work too hard or abuse opioids or play too many video games? These behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they'd say, they're not maladaptive. They're very adaptive. They, they get us through the day. They help us deal with our loneliness, our pain, our depression. I know what that feels like from having gone through that when I was much younger. You get to the, I mean, the, one of the hallmarks of depression is this sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And it becomes because you get this reality distortion. You think things are bad. They'll always be bad. They've always been bad. Anytime you thought you were going to be happy, you were just fooling yourself. And that that's where that sense of, oh my God, it's never going to get better. That's when people start to get suicidal or they start to, you know, uh, do things that are harmful to them because 
the overarching value is to just numb the pain. You know, I've had patients say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends. What are you going to give me? You know, or food fills that void or, you know, uh, uh, one well-known food writer said, fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain or alcohol numbs the pain. We have this opioid epidemic to numb the pain. We've got other drugs we use to numb the pain, you know, benzodiazepines or, uh, you know, video games are a way to distract ourselves from our pain. Or, you know, we've all had, you know, work become workaholics at some time in our life to distract ourselves from our pain. And so when we can help people use the experience of suffering to try these new approaches, like to begin meditating, for example, and they begin to quiet down their mind and rediscover inner sources of peace and joy and well-being, that they're able to, in our support groups, to form these um, incredibly powerful, intimate connections with people they've never even met in person because we're doing it all by Zoom. If anything good came out of Zoom, it was learning we could, out of COVID, it was learning we could do it all by Zoom and it worked just as well, just the connection that really matters. Um, and then we find that, uh, you know, people sometimes even say things like, you know, having a heart attack was one of the best things that ever happened to me. You know, just like, and, you know, like I'd say, having survived depression was the best, one of the best things that ever happened to me because that's what it took to get my attention to begin changing my life in ways that made it so much more joyful and meaningful than I would have ever done before. And so that's really to me what makes this work so interesting and sustainable is that uh, in my limited experience, we're working at, to me, where the, the deepest levels of healing can occur, that even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. You know, yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we've got some nice questions rolling in from our live audience, and I want to encourage people to keep sending in your questions for Dr. Ornish. Just go ahead and click on the Q&A tab and type in your questions. We're going to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, are you open to, to addressing some of those now, Dean? Of course. And I'm, I want to welcome also people who aren't just from Canada, Canada, but from the U.S. and Mexico and Australia, India and Belgium is what's on my chat board here. So thank you. Yes, yes. Um, the first one we'll, we'll look at is there's one from Nida uh, that says, would you recommend yoga nidra and or restorative yoga for stress reduction? Would love to hear about your favorite regular practices. <laughs> well, the, the yoga we teach is restorative yoga. It's not like the, you know, Ashtanga, the uh, Ashtanga yoga. It's uh, more the yin, slow, gentle stretching, you know, deep breathing, you know, Nadi Sudhi to balance the the nadis, you know, the, uh, those kinds of things. So yeah, that's, that's what we do because most people that we work with are so stressed out that they don't need more intensity. They need to really learn to let go and to relax. Wonderful. Thank you. There's a question here from Perry who says how much and how regular sleep is needed for a healthy lifestyle? Well, sleep is really important. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we should almost make that a fifth category, but it's, I put it under the stress management, but it's really more than that. It's how your brain detoxifies. And, you know, seven, seven and a half hours sleep is really minimal for most people. I mean, I, we can all get by with little sleep. I've certainly, when I was doing the intern residency, you know, we'd be up 40 hours straight every other night, pretty much. But um, it's not healthy. You pay a price for doing that. And uh, your risk of Alzheimer's is, for example, and other forms of dementia is much higher when you uh, don't get enough sleep. Thank you. And thanks, Perry. There's one here from Dahlia, uh, spicing it up a little bit, asking about sex life. Dahlia says, does the research have anything to say about the value or harm of a healthy or unhealthy sex life? Well, sex is a very powerful way of intimacy and intimacy is healing. But sex can also be a very powerful way of being isolated, you know, in the most extreme form of rape. So it's not sex per se, it's how you're using it, how you're in integrating it into your life. You know, I, you know, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, where there was a sense of let's, you know, the more sex partners you have, the more happy you're going to be. And it certainly seems to make sense. Like if you're having a great time with one person, think how much more fun you'll have with lots of people. But what I learned is that, um, you can only be intimate to the degree that you can open your heart and be vulnerable. And you can only do that to the degree you feel safe. So the paradox is my wife, Anne and I have been a committed monogamous relationship since we've been lovers for more than, I know, close to 20 years now. Um, and, you know, we've been married for 16. And um, what I learned is that is, is being monogamous, the ball and chain, you know, certainly in the tech world where I live near in San Francisco, there's a whole lot of polyamory stuff, you know, that's like being liberated. 
But what I learned was that it, you can only be intimate the degree you feel safe. And you, it's hard to feel safe when you're having sex with lots of different people. So I, I, instead of having the same kind of more superficial relationship with different people, I find that having a totally committed monogamous relationship is kind of like, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, there was a, a, a South Indian saint um, who said that, you know, you can dig a lot of shallow wells and never reach water. You can dig one deep one and reach the wellspring. And so by being in, in a committed monogamous relationship, the paradox is that intimacy is not binary. It's an infinitely leveled, you know, like the layers of an onion. And the more uh, I can open my heart and be trusting and trustworthy, the more my wife can do that, the more we can open our hearts, the more intimate it becomes and the more erotic it becomes. I, this is something I never knew, except through my own experience, is that the more intimate it is, the more erotic it is. And so instead of having the same superficial experience or similar superficial experiences with different people, we continue to have the most infinitely variable and erotic and amazing experiences with each other. It's kind of like, I, I worked my way through school as a photographer. And I, uh, when I was 12 and 13, I was learning how to do these big portraits and trying to, you know, back then it was airbrush and retouching. This was before Photoshop to try to enlighting to make people look better than they were. And then I studied with a, one of the great photographers of the 20th century. I spent a couple of years studying with a guy named Gary Winogram. We just had a little Leica and we just go out and shoot, you know, black and white pictures as things were. And he'd put a picture on the wall and he'd say, what do you see? And so I say, oh, I see whatever. And they'll say, well, how do you know someone doesn't have a gun right outside the frame? Or how do you know this? We're just trying to challenge our preconceptions. And what I've learned is that great science, great art, great music, great lovemaking, is the more you can do that with beginner's mind, you know, without preconceptions, you know, rather than it's innovation instead of imitation, that you're really open to all possibilities and all degrees of freedom, then the more amazingly it can surprise you. And so instead of being bored with, with the same person, you find that you get increasingly deep levels of intimacy, which is what we're finding, and increasingly erotic and pleasurable and joyful and infinitely variable ways that we make love with each other which is like amazing to me. It's still, it's like, I mean, it, it's always a sense of like, uh, we, we have a saying like yet again, like never before, you know, it's always the same person, even maybe the same acts, but the experience, the energetic experience of that, as the heart opens more and more wide, more and more of that Shakti, that energy, that Kundalini flows through you. And so it's not like even you're making love with someone else. It's like, you're both just kind of entering literally and figuratively the current that, wellspring of energy that can manifest its way as sexual energy, as healing energy, as transformative energy, and so on. And, uh, and so again, what, what I'm really hoping people can understand is that just like what you gain in terms of diet is more than what you give up, that what you gain by being monogamous is more than what you give up. There's no judgment. It's not a moral thing. It's just like, oh, this is how I can have the most fun in life, you know? And that's ultimately what makes these choices sustainable, to take out the, you know, the, you know, finger wagging and, you're bad or, you know, all that judgment and punishment and, you know, all those horrible things, but to say, oh, I know from my own experience, which we're now proving with our studies, that this is the way I can live that has the most meaning, the most fun, the most pleasure, the most juice, the most everything that makes, that makes life wonderful, you know? And so uh, that's really what, why my teacher was so joyful is that he embodied that and really showed me what life could be. So I've really experienced both ends of that spectrum. Thank you. That may be more than one wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, that was that was just excellent. I'm I'm so glad you went into that kind of depth and breadth with it. Uh, Joyce, there's a question from Joyce here who says, "I'm 79, healthy, meditate, active, eat plant based with lots of dark leafy greens, and eat chicken. Is it important to eliminate the chicken? How to get sufficient protein?" Well, you should ask the chicken. I think the chicken would agree. Uh, it's probably a good idea. Uh, you don't need the chicken. Uh, you're still pretty young. I think you're a kid, you know, you got a long way to go. And the animal protein, whether it's, you know, red meat is worse than chicken, but chicken is, you know, it, it increases your risk of, you know, a wide variety of chronic diseases. You don't need it. You get plenty of all the protein you need in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. There's not enough time to talk about it here, but it's all there. You know, you don't, it's very hard to not get enough protein if you eat a, a variety of different foods that are plant-based. But also there are other reasons not to do it. You know, it turns out it, it takes, you know, 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein or even chicken-based protein than plant-based protein. What that means that, you know, 
we don't necessarily, there's enough resources to feed everybody in the world today. Nobody need go hungry if more people aid towards the plant-based end of the spectrum. Uh, your performance is better. As I mentioned earlier, there's a wonderful documentary called The Game Changers that I had a small part in that showed all these elite athletes who raised their game and became, you know, uh, world-class athletes when they went on a plant-based diet. It wasn't, you know, they, they got plenty of protein. These were bodybuilders and, you know, Olympic bike, for, you know, racers that take huge amounts of protein and uh, NFL football stars and so on. They also had a great scene in there showing how sexual function improves so much after a single plant-based meal compared to a a meat-based meal. Uh, more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. It's so easy to say, like, what can I do as one person to make a difference in the world? And just something as simple as, you know, giving up the chicken or just having a meatless Monday for people who aren't ready to make bigger changes than that. Whatever you do, it helps you and it helps what's good for you is good for the planet. What's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And not to mention, you know, the deforestation of the Amazon, which is mostly to clear-cut you know, these beautiful trees to make room for grazing cattle, uh, not to mention the billions and billions of sentient beings that are killed every year that suffer or, or even before they're killed have these horrible lives where they're just like in a, a little lot in a feed lot, you know, where they they're spend their whole life essentially in a crate. Um, you know, I think those things have implications. You know, I believe in karma. I believe in, in uh, you know, what we do affects us and if, uh, what affects others affects us both immediately and in long term. So, for all those reasons, I think these things are worth doing, not as a sense of judgment, but just as, you know, this is the way things are. Thank you. I think we have time for one more audience question. Thanks so much, everybody, for, for bringing in your questions. It's just so great when everyone participates and uh, elevates our discussions. There's a, there's a question here from Karen who says, I was shocked to see in the cardiac ward in the hospital that they served sloppy joes and other red meat dishes. Do you think hospitals will get more in line with healthy nutrition? It was difficult to get a vegetarian diet accommodated. I know it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Um, I'm on the nutrition working group of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, things are changing. Kim Williams was the president of the American College of Cardiology uh, six or seven, five or six years ago, uh, who went on a vegan diet when he his own cholesterol and blood pressure went up and uh, saw my work and went, went on my program and just on his own, just from reading one of my books, got it all down to normal, got off the drugs, he would have been taking the rest of his life and it just changed his life. And he's been a really bright light, but you know, we did a, we published a paper in the leading, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, that the average doctor gets four hours of nutrition training a year, the average cardiologist in four years of fellowship gets zero. So there's a long way to go. But the reason why I spent so many years to work with CMS to get Medicare coverage for our reversing heart disease program is that, you know, money talks, nobody walks like uh, crazy Eddie would say, you know, that, you know, what's reimbursable is sustainable. And we doctors do what we get paid to do. And we get trained to do what we get paid to do. So by now showing that people can make a living using lifestyle medicine for reversing heart disease, um, that that's changing the way that we're trained finally. And so, you know, the arc of uh, justice uh, is long, but bends towards justice, whatever it is. I, I, I'm macerating this this quote, but I think that's true for nutrition and, and um, the kinds of changes that I'd like to see in medicine. That's why I spent so much time doing the research. The research is what enabled Medicare to change the reimbursement. The reimbursement is what often changes medical practice. So I'm taking the long view here and saying, yeah, I'm optimistic that at the same time, the limitations of drugs and surgery are often becoming both unsustainably expensive and, and not working. I mean, there are now eight randomized trials showing that stents and angioplasties really don't work very well in, in stable patients. They don't prolong, prolong life, they don't prevent heart attacks, they don't even reduce angina in most patients. Whereas lifestyle changes can reverse all those and the only side effects are good ones. You know, 86% of the $3.8 trillion we spent in the US last year on healthcare is really sick care. It's for chronic diseases that can often be prevented or reversed by making these simple lifestyle changes at a fraction of the cost and we can, we've already shown we can cut healthcare costs in half in the first year uh, with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations in the U.S. So things are changing. It's taking time, but that's also part of what makes it worth meaningful. You know, the in with the Swami quote, you know, he said, you know, that's why they build temples on hills with lots of steps. So you really appreciate it, and there's more of a sense of meaning when you finally climb up there. You know, it's hard doing this work, but that's part of what makes it meaningful in my life. Thank you. Just want to remind everyone we've been speaking to Dr. Dean Ornish, focusing on his latest book, which is called Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes 
can reverse most chronic diseases. Now, before we close, uh, Dr. Dean, I just want to share uh, one comment here from Judy because I thought it was really nice. Judy says, as you mentioned, having a heart attack and triple bypass, as what happened to me, really does make you sit up and say, what happened there and what did I not see? And now what is it that I need to do to create health and peace within myself to enjoy my time on this earth? Do you have any closing thoughts for us, Dr. Ornish, before we part ways? No, just that, you know, to me, awareness is always the first step in healing of any kind. So I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to share this information. I hope at least some of it in our interview has been, our dialogue has been uh, helpful to those listening to it. There's a lot more in the Undo It book or on our Ornish.com site. If you're interested in uh, signing up for one of our programs, just go to Ornish.com, whether it's the Alzheimer's study or the reversing heart disease programs that are now being offered virtually by Zoom. And um, I hope that you find that, I mean, if you just, you know, have a, have a skeptical, curious attitude, say, okay, let me do my N of one study. I'm going to do this myself for three days, but I'm going to do it 100% for three days. And I promise you that you will feel so much better so quickly, whether you have any chronic diseases or not, but especially if you do, and then you'll know from your own experience, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So let me do more of this and less of that. And that's really what makes it sustainable because you'll know from your own experience, not because some doctor like me or some book told you that. Thank you so much for your time and all the great work you're doing. So very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.